you there. All right. Let's look down at verse 3. The king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel out of the king's seed and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. And now among these were the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names, for he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, I would like to also read to you, although it comes at a later date, I would also like to read to you Esther chapter 4, and this is when she's being challenged to go into the king and petition for the Jews' lives. In chapter 4 and verse 13, then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise to the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Now I have had in my mind as I have been putting together the series of passages that we'll preach in Daniel, the theme for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Last week we asked in our introduction as we were looking at the prophecy of the children of Judah going into captivity, the prophecy that they would be in captivity for 70 years. And of course we'll visit that later and we'll see that at the time that the 70 years is finished, we will actually find the prophecy for the exact date of the birth of the Messiah in Daniel chapter 9. And a lot of that will be... I, I, I'm debating going ahead and preaching that message actually next Wednesday on our Christmas service, uh, for our Christmas service, and looking at how the wise men knew to the day when the Christ child would be born, and uh, looking at that from Daniel chapter 9. That's an important hole in a lot of Christians' understanding of prophecy. And a lot of, you know, I guess probably the most, uh, to my knowledge, the most pinpoint accurate prophecy that's given in, in all Scripture and fulfilled in the birth of Christ. And a lot of Christians just aren't familiar with the uh, 70 years and the 70 weeks of Daniel. And so that'll be actually probably, most likely that'll be the message for our Christmas service this next coming week. It'll be out of uh, chronological order in Daniel, but it'll because it's prophetic and because it's prophecy which has actually already been fulfilled, it won't necessarily be out of order chronologically if you understand what I mean. Okay, for such a time as this, last week when we were in Jeremiah and we were looking at the prophecy that the children of Israel and Judah would go into captivity, they were told that they were supposed to go ahead and build houses and go ahead and, and work for the peace of the city where they lived because that peace would be their peace. So go be part of, go be part of the governments, uh, go be part of the kingdom, and that's precisely what Daniel and the children of Judah are doing here. But we're introduced to the person and the character of this man, Daniel. We asked the question last week. Do you remember? Would you rather be alive? Would you rather be alive in uh, the glory days of King Solomon in Israel, or you could even say the glory days of King David in Israel? Or would you rather be alive in the captivity of Israel? And we answered the question last week, the best time to be alive is the day that God has made you for. And that's the theme of Daniel for such a time as this. As we preach through Daniel, I want you to think 
about the perspective that Daniel might have had, but didn't. The perspective that a lot of people have toward their lot, toward the, you know, we say is as the cookie crumbles or toward their particular lot in life, the hand that they're dealt. Daniel's a young man. He's probably 11, 10 to 12, somewhere in there, years old. And he has lost all of his status and standing as being a prince in Judah. And more than that, he's lost a lot of other things in life that we'll look at in our context this evening. And yet he's an individual that understood the simple truth that the day that God wanted him to be alive was the greatest day. And I hope that as we finish up our study in Daniel, or as we as we continue through it, and, and when we finish it up, that we'll be convinced that we need to be looking for the hand of God in our lives, in our day. And I mean the hand of God in accomplishing His eternal purpose. Because that is exactly what God was doing in a major way during some of the worst days in national Israel. Now let's pray. God, please help us tonight as we go to the Scripture and as we look at the simple truths. And God, is at things that are not, not secret, not difficult to understand. And yet, though they're simple, many times having the attitude purposing in our hearts not to defile ourselves is something that seems difficult to practice. Help us to understand the importance of seeing your hand in our lives in the day in which you made us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The world does not understand eternal purpose. If the world understood eternal purpose, there would be no debate regarding the wanton extermination of human life. Isn't that true? No baby would be aborted if individuals understood the way God looks at life. I'm not just talking about, the, you know, we call it the sanctity of human life, and that's, that's a fine term. I, I, uh, I think that that's one that I would use. I agree with everything that's implied by sanctity of human life. But I mean just the fact that God makes every person for a purpose. Now, God's not helpless. You exterminate a baby's life. And God's grace and God's mercy in that person's life is something beyond our understanding. In other words, a baby who gave his life without ever having done anything in this world on his own has eternal life. Not only that, but his life was for a reason. So it isn't as though he lived for nothing. Whether it's the impact of his life on his mother in the future, whether it is uh, the impact on society that he was a number of, whatever it is, in God's eternal purpose, it's a big deal. Your life in God's eternal purpose is a big deal deal. If you got saved at an early age, if you came to know Christ at a later age, do you realize that God preserved your life? No. Not only so that you could be saved, but so that you could accomplish God's eternal purpose for your life. And do you recognize that God's eternal purpose isn't a self-absorbing purpose? It isn't a purpose that ends in impact with yourself. I wish that God would give us more believers that understood God did not make us to live for our pleasure. God did not make us to live for our pleasure and His pleasure. God made us to live to accomplish His eternal purpose for forever and also for others. Do you see yourself as belonging not only to God, but belonging to others. You see your possessions and things that you have. Now, I'm, not, I'm not preaching socialism or that kind of nonsense. But what I'm saying is that God didn't make me to live out my life for myself. God made me to live for you. God made me to live for the lost and dying world. 
And God made me to live in this generation for this generation. I belong to this generation. Do you realize that? As part of God's eternal purpose. Understanding and knowing that helps us not to trivialize the particular day in which we're alive. I remember uh, getting some pretty silly emails in the 2016 elections from Trump supporters. You all know I like to make fun of Trump supporters, and I like to call people Trump supporters, but I got this nonsensical email from this lady who said that Trump was fulfilling prophecy. That she, was, she wrote, I mean, like a, she wrote a book about Trump fulfilling prophecy. And she predicted, she, she accurately prophesied, actually, uh, his uh, winning the election. And uh, a bunch of, I need to go find the email and see if she, she prophesied any of the other things that have come to pass. And probably send her an apology email, uh, maybe, based on my response to her. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that she said he was basically the Cyrus of his day, you know, and she, I think, if I remember correctly, she evoked a lot of Daniel's prophecy and Trump is fulfilling Bible prophecy and, and nonsense like that, things that actually weren't actually true but were misapplication of the Scripture. But do you know something that is very true? Donald Trump is important in God's eternal purpose, actually. And that's actually true. And do you know what's equally as true? That you are equally important in this generation, in God's eternal purpose. You say, Pastor, nobody today has the impact worldwide that Donald Trump has. Well, as men see it, that's probably true. But as God sees it, it's wholly untrue. It's completely untrue. You have no idea what you're accepting the day in which you were born. And you're embracing God's eternal plan in that day can accomplish in His eternal plan. It's big. It's grandiose. It's, it's, it's much bigger than any of us. God's eternal plan. And you fit in it. You belong in it. I used to uh, think about ministry in terms of legacy. I used to think about church planting in terms of legacy. You know, if you go up in the northeastern United States, there are Baptist churches which are hundreds of years old. Matter of fact, Brother Hansard actually goes to a church in Georgia that's a couple hundred years old. And it's been a good church pretty much the whole time. Good with, you know, qualifications. Good like the church in Jerusalem. You know, a good church. You know what I'm talking about. Not perfect, but good church. And for that period of time. And I used to think, you know something? I want Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church to last a thousand years if the Lord tarries. Used to think along those terms, say, you know what? I want to establish a church that would be a lighthouse for generations to come. And I saw good men fail at accomplishing that. And I asked the question, how could I accomplish that? How, what could I do to set in order events in Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church, plant a church in such a way that its roots it's not able to get away from. You know what the answer to it is? God doesn't even want me to do that. You know what God wants me to do? God wants me to serve this generation in this generation. In other words, when the Great Commission was given in the first century, it was given to them in their day. And you know the Great Commission is given to us in the very same way in our day? What a tragedy it would be if in the day of the apostles, the first century, if any person on earth didn't hear the gospel. What a tragedy that would be. You could ask any of the twelve, I promise you, you could ask any of the twelve apostles, how do you feel about anyone on earth not hearing the gospel? And you know what their answer would be? Oh, that would be terrible because it would not fulfill God's purpose. God wants us to preach the gospel to every creature. Let me ask you a question. How do you feel in this day about any person not hearing the gospel? How do you feel about it? You know, how, how do you feel about living in a city as small as Oakland Park that every one of us could be familiar with every area in it and having any person 
in our city not hear the gospel? How do you feel about that? How do you feel about people in our city going to the grave not knowing who Jesus is or how to have eternal life? See, God's eternal purpose isn't so complex that we can't figure out basically what it's about. Is it? And rather than lament the day in which we live, <laughs> I remember one of the things that frustrated me so much when we first started our church. We got a lot of buzz from uh, people finding us. The internet was pretty new. And because we got, uh, Brother Lee got us started, you know, with a website and so forth right away, we were probably the first, we had the best website in Broward County uh, when, when we first started our church. I mean, we just, we probably had the most web traffic of any church. And I used to get a lot of emails and phone calls from people that found us online and said, wow, an independent Baptist church in Fort Lauderdale. One of the reasons I moved away from Fort Lauderdale was because it was just becoming so godless and I didn't want to raise my family in a godless place. You know, that broke my heart. I thought, you were here? You were here and wanted to raise a family in a godly place? You were here and wanted that? So you moved away? God help you. God help you. Because you don't understand what makes a place godly. I remember when we started our church, I used to think this. I used to think that because there were two churches that used to be within about a mile and a half of this place that were independent Baptist church, had all the pretty much same doctrinal statements, things that we had. I used to think there would be a lot of people that would be really glad to have another church in this area that would come to our church. Because they'd say, oh, we need a church like that. You know what I realized? <laughs> I realized why... One of them closed and one of them moved away. Pastor, what is that? Well, because of the kind of people that went to the church. The kind of people that thought, well, somebody ought to do something. <clears throat> Instead of, we ought to have a church. When I was in seminary, I remember a group from Oklahoma called. They would gotten my name. They knew me through some other people. And they said, there's about 30 of us that have started a church. And we bought property. And uh, we could, we've, we, uh, we're committed to supporting a pastor. Would you come and be our pastor? I thought, that's just wonderful. 30 people that got together and started a church and they want me to be their pastor. And they said, we'll support you. We'll, man, we, we'll take good care of you. And I think they would have. Matter of fact, that church, as far as I know today, is doing very well. You know who started that church? It wasn't a pastor. It was people. So we need a church. Uh, I've seen it in a lot of places. A few a couple years ago in Tennessee, a group of people started a church and they called and said, we want you to come be our pastor. We've started a church. We need a pastor. Well, that's what people should do, isn't it? You know what should have happened in Oakland Park before the prices ever moved here? Somebody should have started a church. You know what needs to happen in every community around us? People need to start a church. What we need are for people to understand, I was born for this. Not somebody somewhere needs to, but this needs to be done, and I'm here. Here's Daniel. Here are three fellows that we know the names of specifically. We know them by their Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. And uh, you could pronounce them like the Chaldeans did, and, but you'd uh, have to blow your nose afterward. So, <laughs> uh, But these three fellows... And uh, listen, they're not the ones who are responsible for the captivity of Israel. But they are three individuals that understand that they were born for such a time as this. And so and we look down into verse, uh, verse 8 where we read our text, and we see the introduction really to the point of the message this evening, and this is purpose. Verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, 
When Daniel talks about defiling himself, what are we talking about here? What does this mean? He has been, the, the prince of the eunuchs has been commanded to give the kings food. The kings drink to these young princes from Judah. You understand what that means? Yes. Pork, pig. Well, it could be pork, yeah, could be, yeah. Yeah, it's more preparation than is the meat because what we see is Daniel doesn't eat any of the meat. He eats vegetables. Okay, so we understand specifically dietary-wise, yeah, they, they weren't allowed to eat lobster. And they weren't allowed to eat shrimp. And that's not really mentioned much in the Scripture. But uh, they weren't allowed to eat uh, pork. But the reality of it would be the preparation of the meat. That was the key. What if it were beef? Well, if it's offered to a Babylonian idol, then it would not be... The word wouldn't have been kosher either, but it would not have been acceptable. It would not have been uh, prepared right according to the law. It uh, would not have been prepared right in the sense of being strangled. You know, just about everybody knows that <laughs> the blood tastes good in the meat. And the, the pagans definitely knew that. And so the, how they killed the meat, instead of bleeding it, they would make sure that the blood stayed in the meat. And that was how they would have preferred it. And so it would have been defiled. It would have been uh, not okay. But really the whole point of it isn't what the meat exactly was. The whole point of it was that in spite of the fact that he's not living in a place where he could go down to the temple. He's not living in a place where uh, the, the sacrifice and the high priest is going to offer the sacrifice once a year. He's not living in a place where actually, scripturally, biblically, Judaism, as prescribed in the Scripture, can be properly practiced. You know what a lot of people do? They excuse themselves, don't they? Well, I can't. You know? Uh, oh, man, I got sound for a second. I, I remember uh, I remember just, just my conscience being bothered a few times as a young person. I remember being a teenager and being at the lake on Sunday. And I remember how different people there responded. You know, the thing is, is that when we were at the lake, we were within 75 or 100 miles of the church. And actually what we could have done is, done is just gone to church. But I remember a couple of times, it wasn't my decision, uh, but a couple of times being at the lake. And I remember a bunch of Christians getting together one Sunday at Lake Canopolis. I remember we had a service at the lake. A whole bunch of us, about 30, 40 of us maybe, and I got together and we had a, we had a uh, church worship service while we were all skipping church. And I just remember, I, I remember just, you know, I, I guess I enjoyed the service, I enjoyed the atmosphere and the people that were there, but my whole thought was that I wasn't where I should have been. And it, it bothered me a little bit because I could have been where I was supposed to be. You know, a lot of times though, you know, I think we're glad for an excuse, aren't we? Glad for a reason to just not, well, I can't do I can't do this. I remember reading God Smuggler some years ago, Brother Andrew. And I think it's a good book. I read it to the teenagers sometimes, but I remember where he read about a part where he's driving down a, down a road that basically turned into a field, and he got stuck in his Volkswagen outside of this, I think it was, uh, I think it was in Germany. I'm not sure about that, but I think it was in Germany or Russia somewhere, uh, outside of this bar, going inside, and the guys in the bar all lifting the car up, basically, and carrying it to the road. And then they brought him inside, and they... They uh, want him to drink a beer with them. And he had a, his conscience that bothered him about drinking beer. But he said, you know, because of where he was and because of what those guys had done for him, he drank the beer. And I just remember uh, thinking about that and thinking, you know, I've been in that situation. And I've been able to not drink the beer and not hurt anybody as a result of it. Matter of fact, it happened here. It was, I, I, it's just really funny. We were doing the fence out here. Luke was here. When this happened, we were putting the fence up out front. Luke was helping, and uh, and brother, I think Mark was there. A few of us were there, and uh, the guys next door were so glad that we were putting the fence up. They were just really cooperative about it. You know, anything we can do. If you need anything, let us know, kind of thing. And uh, I remember about uh, when we were about two thirds of the way through. I remember one of the guys next door went over to I think it was Safeway at the time and bought us some cold beer, and brought them over. He said, "Hey guys, cold beers." And he brought us beer. It was really thoughtful. I mean, very, very um, innocently done. There was, there was no 
nothing other than I want to do something nice for these guys, so I'm going to buy them cold beer. And you know, when somebody does something nice for you, you ought to accept it as what it is, right? And so you know what we did? I just responded to him. I just said, you know, thanks so much. really appreciate that we don't drink. That's all I said. It wasn't, you know, we're better than you or beer's bad or you shouldn't drink. None of those things. It was just, thank you very much. We don't drink. And you know what he said? Oh, more for me. And he uh, went and put it in his, free, in his fridge. And then five minutes later, he came back with some really good Jamaican uh, ginger, ginger beer that was non-alcoholic. He said, can you drink ginger beer? I said, yeah, you bet we can. And, uh, you know, that was all right. And you, know, you say, Pastor, do you think you offended him? I don't think I offended him a bit. He just never heard of anybody not drinking before. Now, what if I drank? If I had drank, I would be to him what every Catholic priest is. Actually. The thing about the your testimony as a Christian is important. Daniel's in a situation where he could very easily say, well, hey, eat or starve. Is that the actual situation? Well, actually, it's, it's more than that. It's actually more than that. It isn't eat or starve. It's eat or be killed. Actually. Now, these young men have already been mutilated physically. They've already lost their gender because of the system that they're in. And it's just, this is a tough situation. The person they're appealing to is the prince of the eunuchs. And these, this is a serious, serious matter. You, they're not asked anything. It's not by committee. They're not told, hey, guys, you know, we're really thinking about for the future of the empire, really training up some, some we're, we want to just, just really build up our future, and we want to have some guys that are really good in language and science, and want to have some thinkers, and you guys are going to be the thinkers. What you think? We weren't told that at all. They were told, you guys meet the qualification, and so this is what's going to happen in your lives, and you're lucky. And that's it. This is what you're going to do. This is who you're going to be. So Daniel, the Bible says, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. Now it's interesting how the scripture phrases it because we are introduced just as much to Hananiah and uh, Mishael and Azariah. Isn't it so? Daniel's not more important than the other of these individuals. But do you understand the importance of one person saying, I'm not going to defile myself? You know, I always knew that was important, but I think the first time, personally, that I was faced, no, nothing of this magnitude, but I was faced with this kind of a situation. I remember being in college, and maybe just out on winter break, freshman year, and I was still only, probably only 18, I guess 18 years old at the time. And I remember being with some of the people my age from our church, some of them from... I had had more of a Christian background, some of them had it. But I remember just being in a car. And I remember a girl that knew just as much as I did what a Christian ought to and ought to do. Turned something on the radio, and uh, it was on for everybody in the car. You know, she turned it on for all of us. And I said, you know, I don't think we, I just don't think that that's for us. That's not for Christians. I didn't say it in those exact words, but said something like that. And I mean, she, she started really making fun of me. And so I beat her up. <laughs> no, not really. <laughs> I don't let anybody make fun of me. I just beat people up. Not, not really. You could, you're free to make fun of me. And she did. She started, started making fun of me. And I really just didn't respond. I just said, well, you know, something that's not right for you, and it's not right for me. It's just not, if it's not right for me, it's not right for you. I'm not trying to be judgmental, but that's what it is. And... My friend said, you know what? It's not right for me either. And a couple years later, I remember being in a place where he told someone, he said, you know, the first time I ever stood for right was when my friend Ryan said, I can't do that. It wasn't, you know, you guys, you shouldn't be doing that. It was, I can't do that. It's not right. I can't do that. And you know something? It was a turning point in his life. 
for one person to say, I can't do that, someone else said, well, you know something that's not right for you, it's not right either. Now I get hit with the, well, you're a pastor. You know, as though God has some kind of, you know, the book of pastors in the Bible. This, you know, there are, there are uh, requirements for a pastor. And, uh, but they, they, they kind of work pretty well for believers in, in, as well. So, Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's meat. And the fascinating thing here is that he's the one that made that decision. And uh, But what we see is that there are other individuals. Now, you know the whole story, right? You know how uh, the, the prince of the eunuchs, um, Ashpenaz, you know how that he had talked about, you're gonna, I'm going to get killed. And so look at verse down to verse 11. Then said Daniel to Melzar whom the prince of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Prove thy servants. Now, prove means to test. Prove thy servants, I beseech thee ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Now, stop here just for a second. This is not healthy. You know what pulse is, right? Everybody know what pulse is? Carrots. You know what pulse is? You ever, know, you ever had some pulse soup? It's vegetables, people. It's vegetables. You know I was trying to trick you. Just vegetables. Okay? Vegetables and water. And let me just tell you something. For some people, for some people who are not healthy, this diet uh, would make them healthier than they would be if they ate something which they were having a reaction to because they're not healthy. Now, I'm actually not even being sarcastic about that. That's actually the fact. The truth is, is that a balanced diet, things that God say are good, are good, but everybody is has a chemical makeup. And some things are really bad for you that are perfectly good for me, and some things are good for you that, uh, well, I don't know what would be good for you, not good for me, but maybe some things are good for you that would be bad for me, and so forth. Actually, this is true. As, as I get older, my body reacts to things more than it used to. Uh, I love beef. It's out of all the different meat, maybe fish, uh, maybe seafood, and, and beef are my favorite meats. But the truth is, is that, that I can get too much beef. It just like I can just feel like, man, I ate too much beef. You know, if I eat like four steaks a day for like three months or something like that, I just get this feeling I had too much. You know what I mean? It's not good for me. Uh, uh, and so, in all seriousness aside, the fact is that, <laughs> that vegetables and water actually, especially for individuals who are being exercised and need, you know, you need protein. And you, I know that, that there's protein in black beans, but it ain't the same, folks. <laughs> right? uh, but seriously, for, for people that are being exercised and people that have a regimen, these, these boys are not... You know, okay, boys, go play, and we'll see who's healthiest at the end of the day. No, these boys are being taught, and they're they're working they're working kids, they're working long hours, and at the end of ten days, the result is that these boys that have been eating the vegetables and water are a lot healthier than the people who aren't. Now, what caused that? God did. That's all. That's all. You know, and, and that's true today, by the way, folks. You can do right, and God can cause the results to work out. That's all it is. Uh, you know, some people say, uh, you know what? There are some circumstances where you can't do right. No, actually, that's not true. You can always do right or die. You can always do right or die, which means you can always do right, because dying for doing right isn't doing wrong, is it? Sometimes Christians act as though the wrong thing is the right thing at some times in life. And you know, it's just never so. Right's always right. And by the way, right's easy. Doing right's easy. You say, Pastor, you're always contradicting that. You're always saying doing right's wrong. No, it wouldn't be difficult to decide to do right. Right? It wouldn't be difficult to decide to do right if, doing, if the right thing were the easiest thing. Doing right isn't the easiest thing. But doing right is actually pretty easy when you do it because God always enables you to be able to do it. 
Understand the qualification I made there? In other words, determining to do right is the difficult thing. Doing right actually isn't. Daniel's decision, these boys' decision, the four of them, their decision that they're not going to defile themselves is actually really easy. Say, what would Daniel have done if Melzar had said, no, you're not doing that? He'd have died. That's what he'd have done. He'd have been killed. That was the alternative. Mm -hmm. It was do or die. You know, that's what right is. Right is do or die. You know, sometimes as Christians, we're too much pragmatists. We're too pragmatic. How does it look? How does a pragmatic Christian look to a lost person? Answer me. How does a pragmatic... You know what pragmatist means? Whatever's practical. Not necessarily what the Bible says, but whatever works the best. How does a pragmatist look to a lost person? Faithless. Faithless? How else? Just like that. Just like that? A, a pragmatic person looks to a lost person like a hypocrite. That's what a pragmatic person looks like to a lost person. Do you know that lost people don't bother me about things that I know are wrong and they know are wrong? Lost people don't try to argue with me that fornication is good, but saved people sometimes do. Lost people don't argue with me about wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise, but saved people do. Lost people don't argue with me about being faithful to serve the Lord, but saved people do. It's always surprising to me that a person who is godless can understand fearing God better than some individuals who ought to fear God. You know, Daniel's not one of these, you know, uh, yeah, he's, he's for real. He's not a, you know, I might, you know what, I'm going to try my best to stay Jewish while I'm in Babylon. No, he knows what Jeremiah said. And he says, okay, I'm here for the long haul. I have to be here. I don't have a choice about that. And I'm going to please God. I'm going to do right. And friend, what we see this evening is very simply this. For such a time as this, God puts you in this place to do right. And so you can do it. You say, Pastor, how can I do right? <laughs> well, actually, that's not me, for me to answer, but I'll tell you how. God will enable you to. God will enable you to. I'm getting old. Old enough to know by experience and not just by faith. You know, there are a lot of things that I always believed to be true because I believe the Bible. But many things that I believe to be true because I believe the Bible, I have experienced are true actually in fact. Not just because the Bible says so, but because I have exercised faith in those things and found God to be true. Now, I knew God was true before I believed Him. That's the great thing about having this Word. You can just have utmost confidence about what you do. In other words, if you will analyze Daniel's attitude, Daniel wasn't in question about what God wanted. He knew what God wanted. And so because he clearly understood what God wanted, he didn't have to worry about what would happen. He simply purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Does that make sense? In other words, Daniel knew he could do right or die. I shouldn't say or. He could do right and live if God wanted, or he could do right and die if that were God's will. Let me ask you a question. Who is it that determines right and wrong? Who determines that? God does. So if God determines what's right for you and it kills you, what does God want for you? He wants you dead. And so if God wants to kill you and you're alive, what does that mean? it means not only that you don't want what God wants, but it means you're not willing to do, you're not willing to serve out God's purpose in your life. What if Stephen didn't want to die? You think Stephen wanted to die? 
what did I say? Did I did I say do you think Stephen didn't want to die? Is that what I just said? Do you think Stephen wanted to die? No. Do you think Stephen was willing to die? Yes. Do you think God wanted Stephen to die? I absolutely know he did. And you know something? That's tough. No, it's not. No, it's not, actually. It's not hard to have somebody kill you. Stephen's not like, well, found out God wants me to die. And he goes out and finds a dangerous person and punches him in the nose. He didn't have to do anything. He just did what was right, and it killed him. John the Baptist. John the Baptist didn't have to say, now how could I really decrease? How could I get out of the way so people don't look at me instead of Jesus? I know I must decrease. You know something? I'm going to take Herod off. You know what would really make him mad is if I make his brother's wife, who's his wife, mad. Sort of a Hunter Biden kind of a scenario, if you think about it. <laughs> you know, uh, you know what I should really do is make him so mad that he'll kill me. No, he didn't have to do anything at all. He just did what he was supposed to do, and he died. And you know something, ultimately, that's our lot in life. As part of God's purpose. Death. I want to die to the glory of God. I know so many individuals who in death were instrumental in other people having eternal life that it just amazes me. I know so many people that were so instrumental in their death and other people having eternal life that it just, I mean, I'm just amazed by it. Just always amazed by the fact that somebody's death could influence someone for eternal life, but it can. Oftentimes does. What's the worst case scenario if you do right? Yeah. Die. Okay, so we have this little motto we say sometimes, right? It's probably not going to kill me. Right? The day ever says, well, this isn't going to kill me. Well, what you could say is, well, it might kill me. <laughs> Actually, could be more accurate. Doing right might kill you. And if God wants it, that's the best thing in the world. That's not suicide. That's not fatalism. That's having a realistic understanding of the heart of God and what it is to be alive for such a time as this. So we've got to live with purpose. And that's how to do it. God, please help us to keep these things in mind. I pray that the my mental aspect of it, God, the mentality that we have, would be that we're going to do right no matter what. We're going to purpose ourselves not to defile ourselves. And Lord, I pray that we would adopt seeing this example of Daniel and the way that you used him in so many ways because of the attitude that he had. I pray that you would help us to be inspired to have the same right attitude, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.